Now, the ITV News in London with Nina Hossein. Good evening, welcome to the ITV News in London tonight. TfL accused of racial discrimination in the High Court over English language tests for Uber drivers. How good do you think your English is? I think my English is good enough for my job. Saved by her wheelchair, police hunt for the hit and run driver who put this woman in hospital. Plus... This planet doesn't belong to us. From Shakespeare to Kong via the Night Manager, live on the red carpet with Tom Hiddleston. And how do you like yours? The pancake recipe getting glowing reviews. Transport for London was accused of indirect racial discrimination in the High Court today for making minicab drivers sit English tests. Uber launched a legal challenge with three of its drivers who are from Hungary, Bulgaria and Pakistan. The company's lawyer argued there was no evidence that their restricted abilities to read and write English had led to problems. Uber says the new rules could lead to 70,000 applicants failing to get a licence. Here's our political correspondent, Simon Harris. He's lived here for almost 25 years. In that time, Hassan Yasser has driven vans, lorries and minicabs. For the past two years, he's worked as an Uber driver in London. But last month, Mr Yasser failed his compulsory English test after being asked to write about the planet Mars. Really have to be very specialised to answer this question, especially about Mars, asking me how you know about Mars. I don't know anything about Mars. How um, good do you think your English is? I think my English is good enough for my job, but it's not good for like being question for the Mars. I don't know. I have never been in Mars. Under the new rules, all of London's minicab drivers will be expected to pass a written and oral test unless they have a GCSE or equivalent qualification in any subject which proves they've studied in English. Transport for London argues it's essential that all taxi and minicab drivers can communicate with their passengers in English. But Uber's lawyer told the High Court the new exams amounted to indirect racial discrimination. Write an essay for your teacher about a festival in a country you know. These are some of the tasks set by examiners. Write an article for a school or college magazine saying what you think is the best way to get fit. Write an essay for your teacher about the problem of river pollution in a city or town. Write an article for an educational website about learning a new language. The new tests don't apply to London's traditional cabbies. Not surprisingly, they're in favour of this hurdle for minicab drivers. It's a basic requirement for an 11-year-old primary school child. Write an essay for your teacher about a festival in a country you should know. You should give examples of what happens at this festival. Is that acceptable? Should cab drivers be able to write 300 words on that? Well, I think it's absolutely essential. You're, you're working as a taxi driver or a private hire driver in one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. The first thing that people expect is that you speak English. Mr Yasser says if he fails the £180 test again, he'll be out of a job. Simon, is this really just a row about how strict these tests are? Well, this is just the latest skirmish in the ongoing war between Transport for London, the taxi app firms like Uber and London's traditional cabbies. TfL and City Hall have real concerns about the number of minicabs, growing number of minicabs swamping London's already congested streets. But Uber claims the bar for these tests has been set too high. Transport for London insists that the exams aren't that difficult. Drivers don't need specific knowledge of subjects like Mars. They're given stuff to read before they write their answers. It's about their ability to com communicate. But Uber claimed today that based on current Failure rates, as you said, something like 70,000 drivers a year could be denied licences. All right, Simon, thank you. And a reminder, you can find out if you've got what it takes to be an Uber driver by going to our website or you'll find some more sample questions from the test. 
Next tonight, how a wheelchair may have saved the life of the victim of a hit and run. Maria Whitefield was hit by a van on a pedestrian crossing at King's Cross yesterday. She was thrown from her chair and spent the night in hospital. Doctors told her she could have died if her wheelchair wasn't so sturdy. Police are still searching for the driver. Rags Martel has the story. Hit by a van in her wheelchair. This is the moment immediately after Maria Whitehead was run over. I was halfway across the road, a white van came speeding. He bashed the side of my wheelchair. My wheelchair tipped to the side. I then went flying out and literally I could not, I could not move. This happened on the Euston Road by King's Cross yesterday afternoon. Maria has spent the last 24 hours in hospital. What was going through your mind when the van hit your wheelchair? I really thought that I was going to die because I was in so much pain. Thankfully, the chair took the most of the force of it and doctors said to me, if it wasn't for the chair, I wouldn't be here today. Maria was crossing this road when her wheelchair was hit. She was knocked to the ground while the van drove off. My chair that is provided by the NHS had been severely damaged. As you can see, they can no longer clip on. Um, I'm having to put my two feet on the left side of my foot plate. The cost uh, of the damage to her wheelchair estimated at three and a half thousand pounds. And if they don't find the driver, it could come back on me and it could be quite a hefty bill. It makes me feel like, what is this world coming to? Like, you really must have not have a heart, knowing that you have not someone over, not, not just anyone, but you've not someone over that have limited mobility and just left them potentially for dead. Maria has now left hospital, but her wheelchair is still damaged and police still haven't found the van driver. Rags Martel, ITV News, King's Cross. Southwark Council has been fined £270,000 after three women and three children died in a fire in 2009. The council pleaded guilty to breaching fire regulations following the fire at the Lacknell House Tower Block in Camberwell. It was caused by a faulty television. London Fire Brigade, which took the council to court, says all landlords have a legal duty to make sure their tenants are safe. A coroner has criticised the police in Tunisia for their shambolic and cowardly response to the terror attacks on a beach which saw a gunman kill 30 British tourists. Among those who died were John Stocker and his wife Janet, who were from Morden. They were sunbathing on the beach at the time and one eyewitness said they were probably the first to be shot by the gunman. A statement from their family said they were a happy couple who had enjoyed all life could afford. Well, there'll be much more on the inquest into the Tunisia terror attacks on the ITV Evening News. Mary has the details. Tunisian police are blamed for a cowardly delay in responding to the terror attacks on a beach in Tunisia. 30 British holidaymakers died in Sousse. A coroner today ruled their deaths were unlawful. Sir Philip Green stumps up £363 million to pay the pensions of former BHS workers and why children in England will be taught about sex and relationships from the age of four. Well, do join me for those stories and more at 6.30. But first, a court has heard how a nanny who is accused of shaking a baby to death asked paramedics, what am I going to tell his parents? Victoria Touts is on trial for the manslaughter of 10-month-old Joshua Paul at his home in Haringey in 2014. Ria Chatterjee is at Blackfriars Crown Court this evening. Ria. Well, the prosecution alleged that Victoria Touts lost her temper with baby Joshua Paul, leading to her assaulting him 
and leading to bleeding on the brain, bleeding in the eyes and other spinal injuries. This afternoon, the jury heard from two paramedics who attended the scene back in August 2014 in Haringey. The first paramedic spoke of walking into the house to find the baby lying on his back, fully clothed in the hallway, with the nanny kneeling beside him, looking extremely distressed and upset. The baby wasn't breathing properly, so the paramedic had to put a small tube into his mouth to try and push air into the lungs. The second paramedic told the court what Victoria Tout said to her at the scene, that the baby had been fine all morning, that she'd heard him crying, went to pick him up, at which point he shook twice, flopped and then stopped breathing. According to the paramedic, the nanny also said, what am I going to tell his parents? Could I have done something more to help him? Now, the prosecution alleged that Victoria Touts's accounts doesn't explain the extent of the baby's injuries. Miss Touts denies manslaughter. Rhea Chatterjee, thank you. Watching the ITV News in London, still to come, the F1 boss who wants more women to join her in the paddock. Plus... I'm really looking forward to it. Okay, let's, give it, really let's give it a bash. Okay. Oh, Martin. Yeah, tastes like, a lot like a pancake. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Martin turns food good. critic for Pancake Day. <laughs> But first, some good news about a story we've brought you over the past six months. May Brown was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukaemia two years ago. She desperately needed a stem cell donation, but her sister Martha in Nigeria was her only hope. There was just one problem. The Home Office wouldn't give Martha a visa to come here to help. Please, I'm appealing to them to help me for my little girl's sake, if not for anything else. Well, since that plea in October, the Home Office changed its mind and now May has had the life-saving treatment she so desperately needed. Our senior correspondent Ron K. Phillips caught up with her and Martha at King's College Hospital. With her sister Martha and daughter Selena, May Brown returns to the hospital where the life-saving procedure was carried out. After she was diagnosed with leukaemia, May was told she would only survive if she had a stem cell transplant. Her sister was the only match, but she lives in Nigeria, and initially the Home Office refused her a visa. Their decision would have been a death sentence. I've, I've prepared myself and I said, well, OK, that is it. And It was um, the worst feeling one can ever imagine. It still haunt me. Late last year, May begged the government to show compassion from her hospital bed. I'm appealing to the UK Home Office to please overturn their decision. After an online petition attracted 60,000 signatures, the decision was overturned. Martha was allowed into the UK and May received the bone marrow in January. She suffered two weeks of ill health and excruciating pain before the transplant suddenly began to work. Oh my God, I got out of bed and I, and I, I was like, I'm not in pain, I'm, I can't feel my body. <laughs> this is the nurse coming and I said to the nurse, I can't feel my body, I, I'm no longer in pain. I said, where does May is grafted properly? It was her sister who gave her the gift of life and the belief there would be a happy ending. And whenever she called me, she told me I'm dying, she keep crying, I tell her, I always tell her to stop crying, that I have this feeling, I believe that if they, um, I get tested, I will be her match. It's I don't know good. what to say to her. I don't know, I'm, I, I, there's nothing you can say to somebody who saved your life. Sometimes gestures say much more than words. Ronke Phillips, ITV News. My next guest tonight grew up around Formula One, her father, Sir Frank Williams' factory, she describes as being a second home to her. 
She joined the family business 15 years ago, rising to become the Williams deputy team principal. At the start of this year, she was awarded an OBE for her services to F1 and has used her position to campaign for more women to enter what is still very much the male-dominated world of motor racing. I'm delighted to say she joins me now, along with Ruth McKernan, who is CEO of Innovate UK, a government agency which funds and supports science and technology. Thank you both for coming in. If I can start with you, when you entered this profession 15 years ago. Did you experience overt sexism when you were first in, in the job? No, do you know, I, in my 15 years in, in Formula One, I've never experienced an ounce of sexism. Um, there isn't, and a lot of people that I've spoken to, that a lot of females that work in our sport, um, it's the same story across the board. It's very little. I think everybody is so busy and concerned with the job that they have to do in Formula One. It's such a fast-paced environment that we work in. Did it help being the, doctor, uh, the, the, uh, the boss's daughter, though, in terms of their attitudes towards you was different if you'd been a different, different woman entering? Yeah, maybe. I mean, no one's going to try that with the boss's daughter perhaps they would only end up getting in trouble but there there was you know other things that I have to then face being the boss's daughter as well you know working harder than anyone else you know it was never a foregone conclusion that I would be given the job that I am now occupying so how, how was Sir Frank with you when when you said I, I want to do the real work in in F1 I, I, I don't want to mess about on the, on the sidelines yeah he wasn't very keen my dad when um, that was presented to him and it was never me I never lobbied for this role or anything like that um, so no he wasn't keen nepotism is a big um, thing for my dad um, so it took a long time to persuade him to give me a very junior job in our press office and I'm very pleased to say I'm still here 15 years later so obviously he's he's come on board and doing so very well why are we failing in, in not just motor racing but in all areas of science and technology to really push to get more women in 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 positions across the board well, I think we're doing a lot better, actually, as I think both of us would demonstrate. We do know, though, that it's a problem. So for Innovate UK, we wanted to find out how much of a problem it was. So we started our Women in Innovation campaign because only one in seven of our grant applications were from women. And actually, that's just not good enough. And if the women were as good as men at getting grants, which they are when they apply, if more of them applied, we could get to the situation where, with more female entrepreneurs in London, that would give us, you know, around about another third in economic growth just in London. So it's really important that we get more women innovation into what will be the most exciting new technology, futuristic industries that, that the UK has to offer. And it's very briefly, is enough, Ruth, being done in schools to make sure younger, younger girls are, are interested in that in the future? Well, there are many different organisations looking at education from different parts of, of the ecosystem. For us, it's much more about getting women applying for funding, wanting to start companies, wanting to reach very senior levels and being very ambitious. And we have some fantastic female ambassadors, of which Claire is one. And, and it's great to have those role models that women can aspire to. Claire, and one day hopefully we'll see women racing against uh, men around, around the tracks, around the world. Thank you both for coming in to talk to me. Thank you. Well, next tonight we've got the premiere of of a huge film for you. It is the first outing for Kong Skull Island in Leicester Square tonight. Tom Hiddleston is the star and we'll catch up with him in a moment. But first, here's a clip. We use explosives to shake the earth, helping us to map the surface of the island. You're dropping bombs. Mm. Scientific instruments. I see trouble on the way. Is that a monkey? Nick Wallace is with the man himself on the red carpet. Nick. It's Tom Hiddleston. Hello, Tom. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? Hello, sir. Uh, where's Mr. Kong? I don't, he's not here tonight. He apologises. He couldn't be here. He's a bit too big even for Leicester Square, he is isn't he? Too, too big for Leicester Square. What's it like acting against a 26-metre CGI monster? Actually, actually, don't tell us. Why don't you show us? Would you give us a 30-second acting masterclass? OK, I'll do my best. OK, right. What I've done is I've brought along, because we, we couldn't find a, a monkey, so we've got my daughter's cuddly toy here. This is, okay. this is Herbert, who's her pet dog. Absolutely now, terrifying. What I want you to do is try and react. Give us the same reaction that you gave when you had to react to the CGI Kong for the very first time. You ready to do this? Oh, yes, I am. Yeah. OK, here we go. He's Give me a moment. Here we go. Yeah, let's go. Here's Herbert! And now Herbert's going to roar. Roar! 
<laughs> Tom Hiddleston, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. That's Hollywood A-list acting you know for you. I wish, I wish we'd had this on set, <laughs> but instead we had a tennis ball or a piece of sellotape um, tied to a post. So this is actually much more. This has more emotive presence. You can yeah. look into Herbert's eyes. That's right. <laughs> Thank God bless Herbert. Thank you for that. I'm gonna have to take it back. She's my daughter. Yes, now let's talk about the film. The one thing that your legions of fans will want to know the most is how much of your kit do you get off in this film? Uh, absolutely none. None? None. That green T-shirt stays on the whole time? A uh, blue T-shirt. A blue T-shirt? <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm getting old as my eyes. No, it's OK. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's a, he's a great character. Uh, he's um, a soldier, former SAS, as you know. Um, the British yeah. SAS, the most highly regarded, highly trained unit in the British Army. And he really is, he's a, a man who knows his way around the jungle. Um, and he's employed by the team to go to this undiscovered island in the South Pacific as a tracker. He's someone who specializes in reconnaissance, um, so he knows how to read the terrain. It's really exciting. He's a good character, but I think the monster sells the movie by itself, doesn't it? It probably it really? does, yeah. Let, let me ask you, what do you find more boring? Is it learning lines or having to be buffed up for so many of these film roles? Is it the gym work or is it the line learning? <laughs> line learning is always, weirdly, is the heavy lifting. It's, that's, that's the bread and butter of an actor. If you, if you don't do that, then then you can't call yourself an actor in a way. Um, but uh, the, the, the training for this was so interesting because I, I wouldn't claim to be anywhere near the fitness oh, of a Tom, professional soldier. I, think, I, I don't know. I've seen, I've seen some of those press shots. You're looking pretty good. Listen, you come out in your suit tonight on a freezing cold, but you spent a year preparing for this in the yeah. hottest tropical climes. So we appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Back it's in a London. pleasure. It's uh, my hometown. Yeah, of course it is. Well, yeah. look, you go inside and get warm. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nick. Tom Hiddleston. Thank Tom, you, Skull Island, out 9th of March. Nick Wallace and Tom, thank you very much. Right. Now, while we're used to seeing famous faces on the red carpet, how about on the tube? Blending in among the passengers on the central line last night was none other than Sir Rod Stewart. He was on his way to perform at the O2 and clearly didn't want to take a risk getting stuck in traffic. Of course, he's not the only celeb to swap chauffeur-driven comfort for public transport of late. Find out which other famous faces have been spotted underground by going to our Facebook page. Next tonight, how is this for a bright idea? If you haven't made your pancakes yet, this next piece might provide you with a little inspiration. Martin Stew met London's self-styled food designers from the Food Museum to taste the pancakes you can eat in the dark. The more tossing, the better. Ready? Three, two, one, go! The annual Westminster pancake race is as much a staple of Shrove Tuesday as lemon and sugar. This year, the House of Commons beat the House of Lords. How, how strange does it feel as a Labour MP to be on the winning team? Almost unheard of. I mean, this was our stoke. If you want to elect for something a little different for dinner, how about a pancake which glows in the dark? That's exactly what's been devised by experimental London food creators Bompus and Parr. We're really interested in things that glow. Um, one of those things is uh, this thing called luciferase can use it in food. What we do is we add this glowing agent into regular pancake batter and um, we'll mix it up and um, be able to actually make a pancake with it. Now can you tell me what's in this secret ingredient here? Unfortunately I can't, it's one of our trade secrets. So we can't be making this at home tonight? No, but one of the ways that you can make it at home tonight is by using tonic water. Um, so, okay. in that sense, if you ever go to a dodgy nightclub and see any of the gin and tonics glowing, it's because of the quinine in the tonic. Pancake cooked. Time for the moment of truth. Let's turn the camera light off. Estelle, flick the switch. Right now, Carla, let's see. Hey, look at that. They really do glow. Amazing. I can reveal the secret ingredient is made from bioluminescent algae, the same stuff which makes the sea look like it's sparkling. I'm assured it's perfectly safe and definitely not radioactive. So, Carla, you promised me we can eat this. I'm going to make you eat some as well. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. OK, let's, give it, really let's give it a bash. OK. Oh, yeah, it tastes like, a lot like a pancake. <laughs> That's the pancake sorted. Now to start the debate on the best filling. You come back with a bit of a glow yeah, all around yeah. you from those adverts. Look, um, 
Before we talk fillings, recipes, have yes. you got a favourite? Mine is dead simple, cup of eggs, cup of flour, cup of milk, pinch of salt. Oh, recipes, I'm more, I'm more into the filling, so for right, me, okay. lemon and sugar. And if you've got a recipe Always. or a filling, go on our Facebook page. We want to hear everyone's best tips so we can try them out tonight as well. What about the weather? Spring, round well, the corner. Spring starts tomorrow. Winter is here, though, still today. In fact, the Dulwich Hamlet match has been called off in Macclesfield Town because well to the north of us, they've had some snow. We're luckily not having snow. So, a really mixed bag for the last day of the winter. It started fine and then it turned wetter. Tomorrow, then, is, uh, uh, according to the Met Office anyway, the first day of spring and it's going to be an equally mixed bag. So, a dry start, but then showers in the middle of the day and a cold night after a cold night tonight as well. And through this week, things pretty unsettled. You can see more rain pushing through. That's what's arriving tomorrow. Thursday, then, looks like being the best day of the week before on Friday, this area of rain coming towards us to bring a bit of a washout day, I'm afraid, for many of us. What's going on out there this evening and tonight? Well, the showers are slowly starting to fizzle out, as you can see. So from about midnight onwards, clearer skies for many of us, a drier picture. And as that cloud starts to break up, we'll see temperatures fall again. Not quite as cold as it was last night, uh, but still relatively chilly. As you can see, down to two degrees there at Gatwick and still a relatively breezy night as well. That means we're going to be off to quite a chilly start tomorrow morning. The earlier on, though, the drier it is. The cloud then starts to build through the morning, and by 10, 11, 12 o'clock-ish, that rain pushing its way right across the London region. I'm afraid for much of the middle of the day, it is going to be wet for most of us as well. Some pulses of heavier rain thrown into the mix. Temperature-wise, a shade up from what we've seen today, so getting up to double figures in Heathrow, as you can see, and relatively breezy too. Then as we look further ahead towards the end of the week, well, as I mentioned, Thursday is the best day of the week. So, some nice spells of sunshine, largely dry and fine for all of us. Friday, a bit of a washout. Then Saturday, you know, we're not quite sure things could change, but it does look like it's going to be a bit of a damp start to the weekend. I'll see you later. Goodbye. And that's the way it's looking so far this Tuesday evening. Mary's got all the latest national and international news next. But from me and all the London team, enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye.